Hey everybody, it is Zach here from the Ed Boys, and welcome to my Chambers of Zarek guide. The Chambers of Zarek was the first raid in OSRS. It features a ton of different bosses to fight for a unique run in every raid, and it has a lot of good rewards that are currently very expensive, including the very coveted Twisted Bow. The idea of the Chambers of Zarek is pretty simple. Each raid is a randomly generated dungeon of five plus rooms, and then the Ulm fight at the end of each one of them. You get points during the raid for doing damage, but you also lose points during the raid every time that you die. The more points that you have at the end of the raid, the better chance you have to get really good rewards. The goal of this guide is to teach you how to get grinding on some raids KC going over your setup and all of the boss mechanics. This guide is not going to go over the entire ins and outs of raids 1. We're going to be focused on team raids for the most part so I'm not going to be going over all of these solo mechanics and we won't be doing things like challenge modes or just speed running tips and tricks. Uh, those are all topics that I would rather make an add-on video after this one or else this video is going to end up being way too long. It's already going to be a lengthy one at this point. I will also be making a quick guide, which is going to be a much more expedited version of this video. It's clearly not going to have as much information, but if you want just a rundown or a reminder on the bosses, that might be the guide for you. It's going to come out a few days after this guide, and it will be linked in the description. I'm going to start this video with the general requirements and recommendations for doing raids, which is really just talk about stats. Then we'll discuss what gear and inventory you're bringing with you. Afterwards, I'll briefly go over scouting, which honestly, we're going to let Runelight handle the majority of that, but we'll talk about which rooms you might want to have in your raid. And then we'll start talking about the pre Ulm rooms and how they actually work. We're going to go over the puzzle rooms and the boss rooms that lead up to the final fight. The Ulm section of the guide will be next. Uh, I'll first just talk about Ulm's mechanics and how the fight goes. Then I'll be going over the different roles that you and your team have during the fight. And once you know all the mechanics of the role, I will show a full Ulm fight. There is a little bit of fast forwarded sections in that full Ulm fight, but we'll, we'll show it all together. And then finally, we'll wrap up the video with a reward section of what you can get from the Chambers of Zarek. This video will have uh, like a decent amount of clips and breakdowns and some pausing and whatnot rather than just straight up full examples. I currently have a couple of full raid videos that are linked in the description and I will be working on even more of those in the future, trying to get more examples out with different gear setups and different rooms in it and whatnot. If you're more interested in just straight up watching examples than watching a guide about the mechanics of the raid, then those might be the vids for you. First, let's go over the requirements for the chambers, more like the recommendations for the most part. Like there's no quests or anything that are required to do raids one, they'll let you in there right away it really comes down to your gear and your stats uh, for your combat stats I would have at least 85 plus in each of them other than prayer you could have a little bit lower prayer but at least 70 for piety would be big and honestly just getting up to 77 prayer for rigor and augury is kind of a big deal 85 plus is fairly minimum if you're trying to really grind it out too. I would say 90 plus in your stats is a pretty big deal. And honestly, if you're really trying to get a lot of KC in any end game content, you should probably try to max your combat. Having a high level in woodcutting, thieving, mining, and especially herb lore can help your team out during Chambers of Zarek, but it's really not necessarily a requirement. This could be something that you ask your teammates beforehand, like who needs what. You are going to be using each combat style during the Chambers of Zarek. Even if you're not a mage or a melee role during the Ulm phase, you still need to have all three attack styles on you. This can add up to a lot of gear, which we'll be going over in the next section. And some of those gear requirements, they might involve some questing, while the other ones just involve some GP to buy it. I really don't want to list off all of the potential quests and GP requirements here necessarily so we'll be talking about those as we get to those items in the guide like I said it's mostly about your stats and your gear for raids requirements so let's go ahead and move on to the gear and the inventory setup there's a lot of different gear that can be used in raids so this will be fairly long section I'll try to speed through it a little bit but I don't want to miss any important parts obviously when I've been asked on stream what raids gear is required to do any raids my short response is to start with these three weapons you have the abyssal tentacle the toxic blowpipe even though it did get nerfed and the trident to the swamp from there you just need decent filler gear for the rest of your slots and then you can get a raid done but just getting a raid done is not always the goal if you want to have a lot of kc from raids and make a lot of money then you're going to want to end up having high-end gear that's going to make a huge difference like I said, you will need all three attack styles. Generally, you're just going to wear your melee gear into the raid with you, and then you bring a range and a magic switch in your inventory. So I'm going to go over each gear slot for the melee gear, and then we'll talk about the mage and range switches in the inventory section. As usual, I'm currently showing what I've been wearing into raids. This isn't the best in slot stuff exactly. Thank you, Torva. But uh, you don't need like an expensive setup to raid either. That's why we're going to go over all of the options here. Let's start with that head slot. The helmet that I have on is the Inquisitor's Helm. Now, the full Inquisitor's set has a good crush bonus, so this does help for rooms like Guardians and Tecton. And even on Ulm's hand, if you're using the Dragon Hunter Lance on crush with full Inquisitors, that is better than stabbing with the Dragon Hunter Lance with Bandos on. This is only if you have the full set of Inquisitors, not just the helmet though. That being said, Torva is still the best in slot helmet for melee, but it is extremely overpriced. It hasn't been keeping its price that well. It's dropping a little bit, so maybe not the best time to be investing in it. We'll see how that works with Raids 3 to be fair. 
Uh, the Nate is not face guard is a great helmet and much cheaper than the other top options. The Serpentine Helm is also a good option and cheaper to get in the first place, but you do have to charge it with Zora's scale, so it's a little bit more expensive to use overall. It also protects you from poison. There's a couple of bosses that can poison you in the raid, so that is fairly convenient. The Helm of Nate is not is not too bad, but you're getting pretty bare minimum at this point. Uh, you could even wear Void Armor. Void is not terrible for damage output, but it has pretty low defense on it. The biggest benefit of Void Armor is that you need less switches overall, so it can save some inventory spaces. And also, having less switches in the middle of a fight could be a little bit less complicated for you. I do currently use Void on my Hardcore Iron Man when I raid, but that's just because I'm kind of lazy about the other gear that I've gotten. So uh, I don't necessarily suggest Void, as it's not like it's bad, but there's better gear. So this is the last time that I will be bringing it up. Next, let's go for the cape slot, which doesn't have quite as many options. The infernal cape is the best melee cape in the game, but if you haven't managed that yet, then the fire cape is your next best option. From there, you could go with an arty cloak 4, which has a stab bonus and a prayer bonus on it. If you happen to be using a crush weapon more often, maybe you're rocking inquisitors like myself, then the mist cape could help you out too, but I really suggest grinding out that fire cape. In the necklace slot, the Amulet of Torture is still killer for the melee life. The Amulet of Fury is still a solid option when learning raids. It's the second best amulet for every attack style, and it has very thick defense on it, so that's very helpful for learners if you're taking more hits. You could potentially go for just the Fury and not bringing any necklace switches for inventory space, and then you could bring some more food. It's hard to leave that old cult necklace in the bank, to be honest. It's so cheap, I imagine you have to be able to afford one at this point. And if you have a Necklace of Anguish, you want to bring that one too. So the Fury, it's nice to have less switches but it's not necessarily like great to just be wearing a fury. I don't personally suggest upgrading your Amulet of Fury to a Blood Fury for the Chambers of Zarek. This will help you heal up a little bit, but it is very expensive to heal with the Blood Fury, and it's not needed for Raids 1. If you can't even afford a Fury, you could go for the Glory, but you probably should at least get a Fury before Raids. So your ammo slots actually going to depend on range switches. If you're bringing a ranged weapon that uses arrows or bolts, then you need to make sure you bring ammo instead of a Blessing. With a Twisted Bow, you want to use Dragon Arrows, though Amethyst Arrows are pretty solid. And if you're using a Crossbow of any kind, you want to bring Ruby Bolts. If you're using a High Level crossbow that can use dragon ruby bolts those are pretty solid too as for the blessing the rada's blessing 4 has a plus 2 prayer bonus while every other blessing has a plus 1 prayer bonus for your melee weapon it may not be a surprise that the scythe is king here it can be switched over to a crush attack style to accommodate for tecton and it absolutely cranks on olm's claw not on crush by the way slash olm's claw uh, you still need a stab weapon to bring with you too if you're using the scythe but we'll talk about that in the inventory section of the guide the dragon hunter lance is not only cheaper than the scythe but it is cheaper to use than the scythe since it doesn't require any charging the lance is sick on olm it has both stab and crush capability Abilities, so it can be used on Vasa, Tecton, and Vanguards. Uh, the Zami Hasta is actually a little bit stronger than the Dragon Hunter Lance, except against dragons, so it's not better against Olm's Claw, which does make a huge difference. But it's still not a bad weapon for raids, though, since it does have crush and stab. Worst case scenario for melee, I would stick with that Abyssal Tentacle, a classic. In your shield slot, you should at least have the Dragon Defender. If you've upgraded to the Avernic Defender, that's very solid, but Dragon is still fine in here. If you don't have a Dragon Defender, but you think your raid's ready, I might have to disagree with you, but worst case scenario, you could bring an Obsidian Shield. In your chest, Torva is best in slot, but like I said with the helmet, Torva is overpriced at the moment, and in general, it has seen a drop in price. It's been kind of fickle, to be fair, with Raids 3 coming out. We'll see how that works. Now, overall, you don't need to invest one bill in Torva just for Chambers of Zarek. If you have it, wear it, but you don't have to go out there and buy it. I'm rocking Inquisitors, which is the next best option as long as you're wearing the full set of Inquisitors, including the helmet and the legs, but it's also not required for Chambers of Zarek. I happen to have Inquisitors because I was using it for a Nightmare Grind, and now here I am doing more Chambers. The Bando's chestplate is solid, and the Fighter Torso is just as good on offense as the BCP, but not as good for defense, so it is still a downgrade. Your legs really go the same way as your chest slot until you get to Bando's. You're better off using Blessed Dehyde Chaps, or whatever range switch that you happen to have. The Bando's Tacits only give a plus two strength bonus, so wearing something like Blessed Dehyde for a little bit better defense, and then having that extra envy space that you don't need to bring extra pants with you, that's kind of nice for some extra food. And Bando's Tacits aren't bad, to be fair, they're just underpowered for the price and the envy space. The gloves decision is an easy one. Ferocious gloves are the best melee gloves in the game. Similar to the necklace slot, the second best gloves though, the Barrow's gloves, also happen to be the second best gloves for both other attack styles. Early in your raid's life, I highly suggest just wearing Barrow's gloves and not bringing the extra glove switch. Eventually, you don't need as many brews while you raid, but you do want the extra envy space early on. If you don't have Barrow's gloves, you gotta work your way down the recipe for disaster gloves until you hit Mithril, which is the same as a combat bracelet. Not that good. The boot slot is also a simple decision. Primordial boots are best in slot, but they're also very expensive, so upgrading from dragon to primordial boots is really one of your last priorities. The guardian boots are not a terrible option, but they're generally harder to get and more expensive than dragon boots, so you can just stick to D boots on the low end. 
Finally, for your ring slot, an imbued Berserker ring is the way to go. It's cheap, and imbuing rings is very easy to do. Though a Brimstone Ring really is not a bad backup option for some balanced stats. There's a lot of different pieces of gear that you could go for, including these switches that we're about to talk about briefly. If you have any questions, of course, leave them in the comments section below. But also, if you want to screenshot your setup and post like an Imgur or a Gyazo in the comments to get some feedback, I would be happy to do that. Let's move on to the inventory section. Early on while learning raids, you don't want to bring quite as many switches with you since you'll want to have more bruise and restore. I do suggest at least using the first two rows of the Envy for switches. I do have six plus for each switch. Let's go over the options here at the moment. For your magic switches, the Sanguine SD Staff is a very solid weapon option. It is expensive to use thanks to blood runes, but it also heals you while you use it, so that's extremely beneficial during the Ohm fight. If you don't have a Sanguine SD, the Trident of the Swamp is a fine replacement. The Occult Necklace is the most important switch for magic. It gives a plus 10% increase your magic damage and it is fairly cheap compared to most other magic switches from there the tormented bracelet is your next biggest mage switch soon to be tied with the new book that is coming out with raids 3 and the ancestral it's two percent per piece of ancestral it's not huge but it is a pretty good boost and also the imbued magic cape does give a plus two percent boost Magic accuracy is still important here, it's not all about the mage damage boost, so if you don't have the funds for the best in slot mage gear and you are trying to lower your switches down, you could wear like Barrow's gloves and ignore a bracelet switch and then have the trident, the occult, and two mystic pieces. You won't be doing a ton of damage, but at least you'll be alright. You could upgrade to Arum's from there, because the jump from Arum's to Ancestral is pretty huge, so if you don't have Ancestral, you're going to be alright, but Ancestral is pretty nice. For the range switches, you have a few more options for your weapon. The Twisted Bow is best in slot for most things here, but the Bow of Ferradin is a very close second, so you do not have to invest all of your money into a T-Bow. As you can see, I've been rocking the Bow for lately. That does mean that I can bring my Crystal Armor for a switch. If you're rocking a different bow, you could bring Arma instead, or maybe even the Masori Armor if you got that cool stuff already. Even Void range here isn't that bad though. Oh, there it is. I brought up that Void again. A crossbow is also a fantastic weapon choice for raids since the ruby bolts can hit a lot of damage. The dragon hunter crossbow is by far your best option here since your final fight is always going to be the dragon. Even as low as a rune crossbow can still use those dragon bolts and hit some hundreds so it's not too bad. The blowpipe did get nerfed but the blowpipe with amethyst darts is still a viable option. That's what I currently use on my hardcore iron man. I did see a big difference right as the nerf happened but I still have some pretty solid raid times. I didn't necessarily get screwed out of it. The Ava's Assembler and the Necklace of Anguish are very big range upgrades. They both give range damage bonuses. If you're only rocking a Fury for the Necklace, you could ignore the Anguish switch if you don't have one, and you could go with the Ava's Accumulator if you haven't done Dragon Slayer 2 yet. I want to at least note my lack of gloves in this inventory. I could potentially switch out the Crystal Helm for some range gloves, or maybe just bring range gloves with me and bring one less potions. Uh, I do use a Dragon Hunter crossbow in Ulm's head, so the Crystal Armor doesn't matter too much once I get to Ulm. The Barrow's gloves are very nice, but also if you have Zarya Van Braces, those are pretty filthy. So the range glove switch is pretty good, and like I said, in general for beginners, or just a good setup to have, is Barrow's, because... The Barrel's Gloves do work for Magic Gloves, Melee Gloves, and Range Gloves. They're not best in slot, but they are second best. I also have my special attack weapon in the inventory here, the Dragon Warhammer. Uh, the BGS is the second best option, and the Bone Dagger can lower some defense too. The spec weapon is important for a few bosses. Tecton has ridiculous defense, and even lowering Ulm's Melee Claw defense is very helpful for the fight, so it's important that everybody brings one of these special attack weapons. Same as I said with the gear section, there's a lot of different pieces of gear that you could bring with you, so if you still have any questions on what you should bring for switches, let me know. There's also a lot of items you're going to need to bring in the raid that aren't necessarily gear switches. Depending on what room you have in the raid, you will need to bring other things like, let's start with the anti-poison. If you have shamans or vespula, you do want an anti-poison. Ulm can poison you too, but it's a very weak poison. You can pretty much just ignore it. You can bring a Sanfu serum so that it also counts as a super restore, which is what I usually do. And you can make anti-poisons within the raid, but honestly, that kind of blows. If you have a mystics room, you should bring an imbued salve amulet. It makes a huge difference on DPS in there. If you have a Guardian's Room, bring your highest level pickaxe. There is an Iron Pickaxe spawn in the room, but that is pretty weak. I prefer to chop the meat tree in the Muted Isle Room, so I do bring an axe for Muted Isles. You could just bring a Bronze Axe, it doesn't have to be a good one. And if your team is going to freeze, instead you don't need an axe, you just got to ask your team beforehand. If you have a Thieving Room, then bringing a Lockpick is helpful, though I find the larger of a team that you have, the less important this is. Finally, if you have a Vasa Room and your main melee weapon doesn't have a good stab bonus, you do have to bring a stab weapon with you, anywhere from the Grazi Rapier to a Dragon and sword will get the job done and we'll talk more about this in the Vasa section of the guide. The rest of the inventory is food and potions other than the rune pouch I guess. The rune pouch will have one of a few spells in it, uh, kind of depends on what everybody else is bringing. At least one team member should bring water spells or humidify for the Ulm fight. Uh, from there you might need one team member to have fire spells for the ice demon, but also thralls can be nice for bonus damage. And there's a few places that vengeance
options could be pretty helpful. So there's a lot of options with the room pouch depending on what is in the raid. Your potion ratio is going to depend on what's in the raid too. Uh, you might need a ranging potion or a super combat, but you could also pre-sip those before you go into the raid. I suggest always bringing at least one stamina potion. You may not need it in a team setting, but it always blows when you do need it and you don't have one. And then the rest of the potions can just be brews and restores or maybe just food as you get better at the rooms and take less damage. I'm purposely trying to not get super specific on which potions to bring and how many of them since it really does vary depending on the raid. But if you have any questions about the inventory setup, make sure to let me know in the comment section below. Let's go ahead and talk about scouting a little bit. The more raids that you do, the more scouting is going to make sense. So this section will add up a little bit more once you have seen all the bosses and whatnot. But you have to scout a raid before you can even start one. So we are going to learn about it early. To actually start a raid, you do have to be in a channel chat. Not in a clan, but just the old channel chat system. And then you can make a party here at the board and go running into your raid. Each raid is randomly generated. But once you're in here, you can see some of the rooms by using your map and adjusting your camera to get a little sneak peek of some of them. You can then use the looks of these rooms to see which bosses you have and then you can use these boss charts to kind of add up what other bosses might be in there. I don't really plan on going that deep into how to manually scout a raid though because it's really not worth your time. You want to use a scouting plugin. As you can see, when I enter the dungeon, I'm just getting a list of rooms served up to me. This is from the Chambers of Zarek plugin on Runelight. It's going to save you a ton of time. You can avoid scouting for a raid altogether if you just have a teammate do it for you or if you're willing to do any room in any order. That can be a real pain though. So let's talk about what raids you're looking for. In general, you want to find a raid with as few rooms as possible. More rooms does make for more points and a better chance at a reward but the ohm fight is where you get the majority of your points on any raid so it's a little bit more efficient to be finding a faster raid and just getting to ohm as quick as possible every time the least amount of rooms that you can get is five it's gonna be three combat and two puzzle rooms occasionally you see that four combat and one puzzle room but that's always gonna have an unknown combat room in there I don't mind doing the unknown puzzle rooms but I try to avoid a raid with any unknown combat rooms in it for your two puzzle rooms the best case scenario is the tightrope and crabs also known as crope these rooms are both very fast. Uh, Ice Demon and Thieving, they're not really that bad, but I avoid having those two as the only puzzle rooms in the raid. If I'm going to do either Ice Demon or Thieving, I would really like the other puzzle room to be at least Crabs or Tightrope. It is worth pointing out that Thieving Room is a lot easier to do than Crab Room. Crab Room can be very frustrating early on, but overall that is one of the fastest rooms in this raid. It's very nice to have Crabs. For the boss rooms, it is nice to only have three of them, but if I get an easy four boss rooms and then two good puzzles like tightrope and crabs, I'm willing to do that six room raid anyway. When you're first learning how to raid, it is reasonable to skip some of the more difficult rooms. You don't really want to do a raid that has multiple rooms that you struggle on, plus the ohm fight if you have a low KC. It's better to learn like one of them at a time for the most part. For when I was learning raids, I was looking at the bosses in three different categories, generally based off their difficulty, but mostly based on like how bad their worst case scenario is. Realistic Realistically, with a good team, you can get carried through most of these fights while you are learning, but if you're trying to solo, then you only have yourself to rely on. At the top here, I have Guardians, Mystics, Shamans, and Muted Isles. Those first three rooms are very easy to do, so I'm happy to see them in any raid. Muted Isles are a little bit tougher than those ones, but it's still on the easier side of things, especially in a team. They also drop overloads, so they're good to have in a raid. These first four rooms are not necessarily the best rooms to do, they're just the simplest ones to start with, in my opinion. For the second row, I have Tecton and Vasa. Vasa is a little bit more click intensive where Tecton is pretty simple to kill. Both of them can be rough because they heal, though. Now, Muted Isles can heal, but they have a limited amount that they can heal. Technically, with Vasa and Tecton, if you just keep messing it up, this fight can take forever, which is very frustrating when you're trying to learn. Again, if you're on a team with some experienced players, then they will likely make up for some of the mistakes that you make while you're learning any of the rooms. Early on with raiding, I avoided trying to have both Tecton and Vasa in the same raid since they both had the potential to give me a little bit of trouble. I didn't want that to happen twice in a single raid. I don't suggest skipping Vasa and Tecton on all together though. They both drop supplies, Tecton actually dropping overloads, and they can be quick rooms when done correctly. So I'm not saying to just outright avoid a raid with both of these in it. In fact, I at this point like these. I like to see both of them in there, but while you're learning, it is reasonable to lean skipping one of these rooms. Also at this point, if you're wondering what I mean by skipping these rooms, you're like, you can just go around it? No, I mean when you're scouting for a raid, if you see that both of these rooms are in there and you don't want to do both of them, then you leave that raid and you scout another one. So that leaves us with just Vanguard's investment. Spula. These two bosses are in their own category for one main reason. They can fully heal if you make a mistake. Technically, Voss and Tecton can fully heal, but it slowly happens over time during the fight. For Vanguards and Vespula, you can be just about to kill them, and then they fully heal and the fight starts over if you really mess it up. With that being said, the rooms are not that difficult. That does sound kind of scary. 
but it's easy to make sure that doesn't happen. Vanguard's does happen to be my least favorite room in the raid. There are three bosses with a decent amount of health, so it tends to be the slowest room, but you can also get very good supplies from it. Vespula is actually one of the fastest rooms in the raid, but there's more requirements for an ideal Vespula room, making it a little bit more of a pain in the ass than the other bosses. I tend to skip Vespula and Vanguard's more than any other boss, especially if we're taking any learners on the raid, but they are still good rooms to do. If you're trying to learn one room at a time, these are the two that I would save for last. You could survive with just scouting raids from like the top two layers, but if you're serious about grinding out raids, you really should learn how to do Vanguard's and Vespula. The order of the rooms will make a difference for your raid a little bit. The more experience that you get at each room, the less that this will tend to matter. But if you're trying to learn a room that you think is difficult, then it's a good idea to find a raid that has that room as the first room. That way you have fresh supplies, and if worse comes to worse, you could just wipe, and at least you only wiped on the first room. If you get an overload drop early, you can use that to help speed through the rooms before Ulm. You don't want to sip your overloads if you're going to need them for Ulm, but if you're going to be making overloads anyway because you have a large team, or maybe you still will have enough for the Ulm fight if you do take a sip, it's worth using them for the pre-Ulm rooms to speed through them. So it can be nice to have like Muted Isles or Tectons very early in the raid. Scouting mostly just comes down to like finding the rooms that you enjoy most, or if you need a specific raid setup for like a speed run or gear limitations and stuff like that. You can grind a ton of raids without ever scouting a single one, but it is convenient to do the rooms that you like to do. If you have any questions about scouting, let me know in the comments section below. Let's begin going over the puzzles first with the tightrope room. Very simply, to dispel the barrier at the exit of the room, you're going to need the keystone crystal, which is on the other side of the tightrope. You can cross the tightrope at any time as long as you have the agility level, but any of the majors or rangers in the room that aren't already fighting somebody will then target the player that is crossing the rope. You don't take any damage while crossing the rope, nor can you eat food during the cross. Instead, you're just going to take a ton of damage as soon as you get to the other side, so be very careful with that. The majors and rangers are not aggressive if you're not crossing the tightrope, so you can just pick them off one at a time using your ranged weapon. They are fairly weak, so even the blowpipe should breeze through this fairly quickly. Uh, the majors are weaker than the rangers, so it's good to start with them. The NPCs will not switch targets unless they can't see their target for too long and they're attacked by somebody else. So one teammate can just tank a major or a ranger while the others don't have to use their overheads. Both of the majors and rangers can be safe spotted a little bit. It's not necessarily a safe spot. Uh, you can't really set up to where you are attacking them and they are not attacking you at all. But you can slow down their attacks a little bit, which is mostly helpful if you have teammates that are also doing damage to them constantly. First of all, if you have a weapon with a range of at least 10, like a bow of Ferdin or a twisted bow, then you can outrange all of these monsters here. So for example here, if I stand just a little bit out of the Major's distance, he can't hit me. I can use one attack and run back out of his attack range. He'll use one attack there, but now my teammates can damage it while I'm standing out of attack range and it's not doing any damage to us. The Rangers, you can also use this flower to get out of their sight, but that also depends on the layout of the room. Sometimes this is going to be the door with the barrier and you have to use that to hide from them, but it still works the same. When you're fighting as a team, the player who's being targeted by the Ranger can hide back here while their teammates then get a couple of hits. They can attack once and run back here. This is only a good strategy just again for letting your teammates do more damage while you don't take as much damage that way the tank is not just chugging potions in this room so if you're soloing this room you really don't need to use the safe spots at all unless maybe you have a thrall that's doing a little bit more damage for you and you're low on potions or you're using something like a tebow which is a five tick weapon that means you're attacking slower than these monsters so it does help to hide in a safe spot and kind of slow their attack down a little bit once there's only one ranger remaining and it has already targeted a different teammate, then another team member could make their way across the rope to get the keystone. The agility requirement is going to be based off of the team's average agility level, and using the keystone to spell the barrier will kill any majors or rangers that are still alive. So some people even bring like full tank armor, including the Din's Bulwark, and just straight up skip this rope room. I think that is used a little bit more often for like a speed run. It's not necessarily the most efficient for every raid that you have a tightrope, but technically you could even skip killing all of these things. For the next puzzle, we have the Crab Room. This room is often frustrating to learn, but it is one of the fastest puzzles when it is done correctly, and it requires very minimal supplies, just some prayer points. There are four colored crystals in the room, and one light orb that will constantly shoot from the sculpture in the room. The light orb can be redirected and recolored when it hits one of the crabs. Hitting the colored crystals with the correctly colored light orb will turn the crystal white, and when you've turned all four of these crystals white, the door will be unblocked. The more players that are in your raid, the more crabs that will spawn in the room, but you never need more than three crabs to complete any of the rooms. Any extra crabs should just be held out of the way by any other teammates rather than letting them roam around the room randomly. When the light orb hits a crab, it will change direction, always going clockwise. So if it's currently moving north into a crab, it'll bounce off to the east. If it's currently moving east, it'll bounce off to the south, and so on. Each player can get a crab aggroed on them, but you also can use a hammer to right-click and crush a crab, which will turn it red for a few seconds, but also make it stay in place for a little while. The 
more players that you have in a raid, the less time that the crab will be stuck in place after getting crushed. But if you're in a solo, you get like 25 to 30 seconds out of a crushed crab. You can use a dragon warhammer to crush the crabs, and apparently an elder maul or an abyssal bludgeon would do the job too, but you do have to have them equipped. If you don't have any of these things, there is a hammer spawn at the beginning of the room, and you can just use a regular hammer to do this crush. So you have to use the crabs to direct the light at the crystals, but you also have to change the light to the correct color. The white light that it's on automatically will dissipate the black crystal. A red light, which is achieved by using Neely on a crab, will dissipate the blue crystal. A green light will knock out that purple crystal, and you can turn the light green by using a range attack on one of the crabs. And that leaves the yellow crystal, which is dissipated by a blue light achieved by using magic on one of these crabs before the light hits it. So you do need all three combat styles to get through this room. You will need to hit a crab with range, magic, and melee at some point. Here's a quick look at an example of just one full run on a solo on this room really quickly so that you can get the mechanics of it. This is actually a solid room for the example crabs because we'll have to get, uh, we'll use one crab for this one, two crabs for this one, and three for each of these crystals. So we get a few examples here. First of all, if you hustle bus on this magenta crystal, you can just get one green crab right in the way real quick. We just barely got that. It even looked like we didn't get it because of animation delay, but... First crystal down. We're going to need two crabs to get this blue one. So I'm smashing this one over here. And that one I thought was going to follow me. So it's kind of going to be in the way. I'm going to smash this crab in the right place over here. I'm going to first see what happens. The one we already smashed. We're good to go. This has already turned back to white. So i got to make sure to attack it quick. I'm just going to smash it so that it stays over here. We've turned the light red for the blue crystal. And we're good to go. I'm going to smash the one that was already stuck. Drag this one over here so that now this crystal is going to be bouncing north. I could hustle bus and grab this one quick, but I don't think I was going to get it in time if I really hustled that hard anyway. So I'm just going to have him run over to me. And this should line up now where that light was bouncing up to here. And now it's going to bounce over to the yellow crystal. We have to make sure to turn this light blue though. And then right after it hits the crab that's on me, I'm going to hustle and smash these two crabs just to make sure. I think we had enough time that they were going to stand still, but just in case I get that smash real quick. Make sure to line this up. Hopefully that turns white again. Oh, thank goodness. And I could have smashed this crab and tried to run away, but we may have had the same problem where it would have still been red. It would have turned that light red, and then it wouldn't have gotten that crystal. And that's it. That's already all four lights. Easy peasy. We're moving on to the ice demon room. This is a puzzle room technically, but half of it does involve combat. And basically, you just need to chop kindling from these trees to light fires near the ice demon. This is going to thaw him out, where eventually you can kill it and move on to the next room. There is an axe and a tinderbox spawn at the beginning of the room. There's also a chest in the room so you can clear out some of your inventory space to chop kindling. If you are soloing, then you're going to need two inventories of kindling to thaw out the demon. Usually I do chop another half of an inventory of kindling while I'm waiting on it to thaw just in case. It is kind of annoying to just barely not get the ice demon to thaw and it starts healing up and you don't have any kindling and you're just kind of rushing to chop some more. This ice fiend over here does attack the fire that is next to it so you want to avoid the ice fiend in small groups. Once you're in a team of like 3 plus, you can't really avoid it at all but that doesn't really matter because with the team you don't need as many logs as you did with the solo you're really only going to do like one inventory maybe a, an extra half for each person it is better to have multiple fires going by the way so that it thaws out faster make sure to keep your eye on the health bar for the ice thawing and you get your gear out of the chest before the fight starts it really is a pain to get items out of the chest while the demon is attacking if you're in a solo it's nearly impossible the Ice Demon is weak to fire spells by a long shot. Fire spells are given a 50% damage boost on the Ice Demon, while other weapons are actually reduced to only one-third of their max hit. So the Ice Demon does not have a lot of health. The Tebow and the Bofa, even the Blowpipe, will get the job done against this guy, but it is very beneficial to have one teammate with fire spells on them for the fight. It can also be nice to land a Dragon Warhammer spec or a BGS spec to lower his defense a little bit, but you do not want to do this if Tecton or Vasa is in the next room. We're going to talk about those bosses in the boss section of this guide, but both of of them kind of require a spec, especially Tecton. You do not want to go into Tecton without having full special attack energy. The Ice Demon does use two different attacks. He has a freezing spell and he throws snowballs. Both of the attacks hit a 3x3 three three area. Even though the snowball looks like it's just one tile, it's still going to take up nine tiles just like that magic spell does. So don't be right next to one. If you use protect from range, then the demon will not use his magic attack at all. It seems a little backwards, but it is true. If you have protect from range on, he won't use a magic attack against you. So as long as you're far away from the demon, you can react to the snowballs very easily and you should take no damage overall. In a team setting, one player can stand like kind of close to the demon and they can do all of the running while the snowballs are only thrown at them while the other teammates stand as far away as possible and they can have their overheads off and just range it or even mage it from afar 
Running the snowballs is very easy. With a blowpipe, you can attack twice and then run two squares and you'll never miss an attack. The Bofa is a four tick weapon, so you can just do one attack on each spot. Occasionally, you'll be able to squeeze in a second attack. Uh, it's not as easy to time, in my opinion, as the blowpipe is, but it is also a lot less click intensive and it hits harder. In general, these snowballs are very reactable too, so you don't even have to like time it that well. You just look at them and make sure they're not hitting you. Run away as they're coming at you. If you're using a Tebow or magic spells, then you're attacking at a 5 tick pace, which is a little bit slower than that Bofa. Unless you're using a harmonized staff, I guess. Uh, this is not going to line up with the snowballs quite as easily. Again, you just got to keep your feet moving though. If you're using fire spells, the fight is not going to last very long in general. So try to keep your feet moving while manually casting fire spells in this thing. Kind of annoying, really only has to happen for like 30 seconds. For the final puzzle room, we have the Thieving Room. My least favorite puzzle room since it is very boring, but it doesn't take too long to get through and you're not going to use any supplies in here like food or prayer potions. This room is very simple. You have to pick lock the chest with your superior thieving ability to potentially get some grubs. Now, this can be sped up if you have a lockpick, by the way. You don't have to bring a lockpick, but it does kind of help if you have the empty space. Plus, you can get a lockpick from one of the scavengers in one of the other rooms, not from this giant scavenger in this thieving room. All the grubs that you get from the chest, you have to put it into the feeding trough. This scavenger will start to eat it until he's got enough food and he goes to sleep and he unblocks the path. If you're doing a solo run, you will need 30 grubs. You're going to need more for a larger team, but it's not 30 grubs per person by any means. A good strategy for a team is to fill up half of your inventory and then dump your grubs and go back for a few more. If the scavenger stops eating for a full minute because the trough is out of grubs, it is going to heal. But honestly, that is very difficult to let happen. Uh, you have to be going pretty slow. You almost have to purposely let it heal. You do get 100 points for each grub that you put in the trough, but once you have put enough grubs in the trough that the scavenger is going to be able to eat and fall asleep, you don't get any more points from that. So if you ever put grubs in the trough and you don't get 100 points for those grubs, you know that the team is already done. This is very easy to test by just dropping one of your grubs before you feed it. Feed all the grubs, pick up that one, feed it again, see if you get an extra 100 points from that one grub. If you don't, then the whole team is already done. So there are poison chests in the room. These will not move, so if you open a chest and you take some poison damage, then just make sure not to open that chest again. It will not actually inflict any poison on you. It'll just do like a green poison hit splat You don't have to have an anti-poison for this room. There's also one bat chest in the room It is not 100% necessary to find the bats But you do get extra points for that which is solid if you've already got enough grubs to finish the room and you didn't find the bats Just move on though. It's not worth sticking around just for the bats Now we are moving on to the combat room, starting with some pretty easy ones. Welcome to the Mystics room. Three or more Mystics are going to spawn in the room, depending on how many players are in the raid. You just have to kill all the Mystics, and the sigil at the door will disappear, allowing you to move on. Use range to kill the Mystics. Tebow is going to slap, but the Bofa pretty much hits like a Tebow in here. In fact, I believe the Bofa is best in slot for a solo raid. I think once you scale up these Mystics in a team, their magic level gets high enough that the Tebow is going to be better. The Blowpipe nerf did really hurt the BP for this room, but it still can get the job done in here. If you do have one teammate with a crossbow using enchanted ruby bolts can help too, especially with a large team. The more health that a monster has, the more damage the ruby bolt spec is going to hit. The most important part of your offense for this room is definitely your salve amulet. You got to make sure that it is imbued so it helps with range. The salve amulet is always the call for undead creatures, which these things are. The most helpful teammates on the team do hit each other with that salve check when the room starts as it makes a huge difference. The mages use magic and melee, but they're only going to attempt to use melee if they have like a route to get to you. They will do some damage through your protection prayers, but you should still use protect from magic in here because it will reduce the damage. In general, you only want to be fighting one mystic at a time while the others are not attacking at all. Anytime they have multiple mystics attacking, even if they're attacking different team members, it is a waste of supplies. Sometimes with how the layout of the room is and how the mystics randomly walk around, you can just pick them off one at a time, but if one of them happens to wander too close or you accidentally attack a different mystic than the team is attacking, then you can go round them up to stop them from using magic attacks. If you run up really close to one of the mystics, it will eventually try to melee attack you. Once a mystic is following you and it's attempting to use that that melee attack it is not going to target any other players anymore unless of course another player were to attack it and it's also going to be locked into using that melee attack so the player who's being targeted can go hide in a safe spot and the mystic will no longer be able to use any attacks until it gets hit again so if you have multiple mystics attacking one player just has to go get that melee attack aggro from all the ones that you don't want to be attacking and then head to one of the millions of the safe spots in the room you can just run around one of the walls there's often one corner in the room that they can't fit into if you all head over there you could even just do like a little corner trick so that they won't run up to you the Mystics drop seeds, so make sure that somebody picks them up if you haven't done your setup for Ulm yet. 
Next, we have the Guardians. All you have to do to move on from this room is kill both of these statues. They can only take damage from pickaxes. If you didn't bring a pickaxe with you, there is an iron pickaxe spawn in the room for you. The crystal and the dragon pickaxe are tied for the best pick, though the crystal pickaxe is lighter, so it is better to bring for run energy. Uh, the room pickaxe is not that much slower than these two, especially if you are potted up and using piety. I guess it is a significant difference, but this is one of the quickest rooms already, so you can only shave so much time off of it by upgrading to the dragon pickaxe. Uh, it's not that expensive of an upgrade, but say you're an iron man with only a rune pick, you're gonna be okay. The pickaxe is a slow weapon, so you don't just want to stand there and fight, as you're going to take a lot of damage. Instead, you want to flinch them, which means attacking once and then running away, and then attacking again and running away. You can attack once and run back two spaces. You can just keep attacking from those two squares back if you'd like. All pickaxes are a five tick weapon, so if you want to count out your ticks, you can attack on one, walk back on two, and wait three more ticks. Uh, if you don't feel like counting it out though, you can just wait until your screen stops moving and that's when you attack the statue again. You can take one step in after you run away from the statue, that way you're only walking one square up to the statue when you attack it, and this is going to save you some run energy. Again, you could count this one out, you attack on tick one, walk back two squares on tick two, walk back in on tick three and wait two more ticks. Most people don't really like counting out the ticks, that's usually what I'm doing in my head, but for this one, you could just wait until your character stops moving. If you click as soon as your character is stationary, you should be able to attack right away. So if you have multiple players that are attacking the same statue and one of them runs in just a little bit too late, it's generally better for the other player to wait an extra tick for the teammate since you can't attack any faster with a pickaxe. Once you're one tick behind, you'd have to wait four more ticks to be able to catch up. So it's kind of nice if your teammate just waits one. It's even nicer if you weren't late in the first place, let's be honest. And I get a little cocky in this room as I am wearing Inquisitors and you do want to be using Crush with your pickaxe. So I do a lot of damage and I usually don't really wait around. I just keep attacking. These Guardians do drop seeds also, so if you have not done your farming run, make sure at least one teammate picks up some seeds for the squad. Next, we have the Shaman's Room. This room is a bit unpopular early on, but it's one of the fastest rooms, and if it's done correctly, you should really only use some Prayer Sips, maybe a Stamina Sip, and I guess some Anti Poison. There will be two or more Shamans in the room, depending on how many players are in the raid. These Shamans are just like any Shaman outside of the raid, other than the fact that these ones can't drop the Dragon Warhammer, very sadly. It mostly uses range attacks, so you want to be on Protect from range. You can get inflicted with poison, even if you are protecting from range, so it's suggested to bring some form of an Anti Poison, like a Sanfu Serum. Uh, if you're rocking a Serpentine, helm or one of the recolors of it for your melee helm you could just use that in this room to make sure you don't get poisoned you can also make an anti-poison within the raid but the shaman poison does a lot of damage so you might die from it before you actually get to the next farming room the main attack that you're trying to dodge here is that big green ball that hits like 30 plus damage normally when fighting shamans you have that tier 5 shazian armor but this time you're not going to have it like it's not worth bringing that into a raid so you always have to keep your feet moving since you're always running around it's pretty easy to dodge those purple spawns but even if you don't they don't hit very hard and then the only other attack is when they jump in the air if you stay on the walls then they can't use this attack uh, i guess they do have a melee attack too but you're using range to kill these you should be standing far away from them so using the blowpipe in this room can kind of be a bit of a pain since you have no range and it attacks so quickly that it's very click intensive but as long as you have your character running on the same tick as the shaman attacks you can run an attack without ever getting hit by one of those green balls you don't have to really like think about it at all once you have the timing correctly it'll just work this is a little simpler to do if you have a slower weapon, like the Bofa or the Tebow, but overall, once you get in a good rhythm of running exactly when the Shaman attacks, you have to click right before he attacks so that your character is moving at the same exact tick that he's attacking you. You should basically take zero damage in this room, and it takes like a minute to complete. If you get the Shaman's room that has this small tunnel to get into the room, you can actually use the first entrance to safe spot the Shamans, as long as you have a good weapon with good range, like the Tebow or Bofa. You have to attack the Shaman first, then you can lead it up into the corner of the room by actually going back into the previous room then once it's up in that corner you can head back into the tunnel and outrange the shaman from there this is mostly convenient for large teams since it is hectic to run around the room with a lot of people and not every shaman's room is going to be this layout necessarily so you should learn how to fight them without the safe spot the shamans also drop seeds so make sure that a teammate picks up some of those seeds if you haven't done your preparation yet Next, we have the Muted Isles. This room is very simple, but the Muted Isles can hit pretty hard, so sometimes you're going to take a lot of damage in here. And there's multiple ways to deal with, like, the healing in the room and each Muted Isle is a little bit different, so this is kind of a long section. You have two Muted Isles to KO before you can move on from this room. First, the Baby Muted Isle, and then once that one is dead, there's a big Muted Isle that'll come up out of the water. That thing will also be attacking you with magic attacks while you're killing the little one. There's also a Meat Tree in the room that the Muted Isles will eat from once they get below half health. They heal a lot from this tree, so you do not want 
want that to happen. There's a couple ways to avoid this. As you can see, I am a fan of chopping the tree, but that's not the only option. You can also freeze the muted isle so that it won't be able to eat. This can be done with either freeze spells or a Zami God Sword spec. Uh, this method can make for quick kills if all goes well, but there's also some downsides to freezing them. When the muted isles begin to eat, they do become invincible until they are done eating. So even when frozen, the muted isle has like five or ten seconds where nobody can do any damage to it until it starts targeting a player again. Also, if you miss a freeze for any reason and it makes it to the tree, it's going to heal a few hundred health. You can rather just chop the tree with an axe. There is no axe spawn in the room, so this does require everybody to bring an axe with them. You can get an axe drop from a scavenger in one of the scavenger rooms, but that's a lot slower than just bringing one with you. All axes have the same chopping ability on this tree, so even though I bring my dragon axe all the time, a bronze axe is just as good, and you can drop it off when you're done if you do need the envy space. Your wood cutting level does affect how fast you chop the tree, though. While you're on the tree, it's a good idea to put on some mage gear and protect from range. If the little muted isle walks right up to you, then switch to protect from melee. You can sit, bruise, or attack muted isles between chops. Try to do like one thing between chops, unless you can kind of combo. Like you can combo eat, or you could sip a brew and click on the muted isle. Like same tick, both things will happen. Then you can click right back on the tree and make sure to only do something right as you see a wood cutting XP drop. As long as the whole squad is chopping the tree, it really doesn't take too long to get through it, but you can tank some decent damage if it's going kind of slow. So a lot of players do opt into freezing it. I find in a full night of raids especially for swapping out team members because some have to leave or others arrive that chopping the tree has just been always more consistent there's nothing worse than having the muted isle heal like 300 plus health real quick the little muted isle can be killed with a few different attack styles actually uh, it's pretty weak to magic so i have found that the magic setup has been like extremely consistent for me and it helps defend from magic attacks from the big one in the water a range is also still solid on this one the bofa cranks and the bp is still all right even with the nerf uh, the little muted isle also has a negative stab defense bonus so like max melee gear with a rapier is really sick on this thing so the big muted isle has different defensive stats though you want to use range against this one it has very good magic defense and it hits way too hard to be willing to stand up close and then take those melee hits even if you protect it from melee it then hits you with range hits which are also way too strong as usual with the chambers of Zarek, the tebow is ridiculous but that bofa is a close second they're both gonna shred the big muted isle and honestly the blowpipe's really not that bad of a backup uh, if one person is willing to run in and use a dragon warhammer spec will really help especially for blowpipe users and if you brought a crossbow the ruby bolt specs will help it's still a good option to try to hit some hundreds when it has a lot of health left Defending yourself from the big muted isle is different than the little one. It uses all three attack styles, so you want to protect from range, stay far away from it so you can't get hit with melee, and then you just tank the mage hits. There's always a safe spot in the room that you can use for its melee attack, but that depends on the room's orientation. The easiest one to recognize is when the entrance to the room is in the north, and then you have the strange bells by the entrance like this. If you stand all the way in the corner at the entrance, the big muted isle is too big to fit in here, so you're going to be safe. The other safe spots all depend on which direction the room is oriented. So this little corner water spot will work as long as the muted isle is standing to the west of you rather than the east of you. As you can see in this one, uh, he's standing to our east. That means that he can kind of come around the north side. If it was the other way around, uh, he leans north before south, and he wouldn't be able to come around the south side of this corner. Really, for any big NPC that you're trying to get stuck on a corner, it helps if you can be standing on the east side of it. Uh, it will prioritize east and west before north and south, but then it'll lean a little bit north before it'll lean south. If the big muted isle's water is in the southern part of the room, then you can instead use the door on the west side to safe spot. He's going to prioritize east and west before north and south, but he's also going to lean north before he leans south. So if the water is on the north side of the room, this safe spot is not going to work. Instead, you have to kind of work the muted isle around so that you can use that same corner in the other spot, but this time switching spots with the muted isle. You don't have to use these safe spots at all, to be fair. You just got to stay out of the melee range or you're going to get tagged really hard. And as long as one person on the team knows where the safe spot is, you just have to follow them. Both muted isles do drop some supplies, including strong overloads, which is very convenient, making it uh, kind of a sought-out room. The little muted isle gives one overload plus, one prayer enhance plus, and then one or two stinkhorn mushrooms, while the big muted isle drops an overload plus, a prayer enhance plus, a xerix aid plus, and a revitalization. Depending on your team size and how your own fights tend to go, the overload and the prayer enhance from the muted isles can be enough to just skip having to make any of them later. Let's move on to one of my surprise favorites, Vasa Nisterio. I really did not like Vasa early on, and that was mostly a me problem. Uh, as a squad, like the first week that raids were out, one of the very first times we ever had to fight Vasa, it took 
an extremely long time. It did not go well. But as with any raids boss, if you mess it up, it can be very frustrating too. Here's a rundown of the fight. Vasa will spawn as soon as somebody gets close enough to the pile of rocks in the middle. You really should only send one teammate in to do this, and we'll get to why in a second. Vasa will animate in and then use his teleport attack, which will bring half of the players in the room very close to him and deal some big damage. After the attack, he walks over to one of the crystals in the room and tries to heal. You have to attack Vasa with range while he's in motion and then attack the crystal with stab. Once the crystal is KO'd, you can attack him with range again until he gets to another crystal, stab that crystal. Once he walks away from that one, range him again. And once you kill Vasa, you can move on to the next room. Let's first go back to that teleport attack. If you only send one person in the room, then it can only teleport that one person to the middle. So it's not good to just send everybody in. Otherwise, half of them are going to take damage. You might as well only send one guinea pig to take damage. And then everybody can go protect the guinea pig. If you stand too close to the entrance of the room, then you will be teleported in as the other person runs into the middle. So you have to kind of step a couple steps back and be careful there, but also you have to be quick when you get back in. Even standing too close to the entrance as it spawns can get you teleported into the room. Even if you're on the other side of the flames as they appear, it, it can teleport you. So be careful with that one. As soon as the player is teleported up to Vasa, their prayers are going to be disabled and Vasa has already decided how much damage he's going to do, which in a solo would just be your remaining health minus five. So it'll leave you at five health. But in a team setting, it averages all of the player's remaining health left. In general, it's going to leave you at fairly low health though. Even standing too close to the entrance as it spawns can get you teleported into the room. Even if you're on the other side of the flames as they appear, it, it can teleport you. So be careful with that one. As soon as the player is teleported up to Vasa, their prayers are going to be disabled. And Vasa has already decided how much damage he's going to do. Which in a solo would just be your remaining health minus 5. So it'll leave you at 5 health. But in a team setting, it averages all of the player's remaining health left. In general, it's going to leave you at fairly low health though. You can heal up a little bit between the time that you get teleported and when it actually damages you. So you're not just immediately at five health but this should only be a problem in solos anybody who is not teleported in they still have their overhead prayers so they can run in and protect from magic you will not take any damage while you're using protect from magic and as long as you get hit with the attack while protecting from magic it will reduce some of the damage that the others take so if you are not teleported in right after any teleport attack just run right up to vasa and use protect from magic this is going to help your teammates take a lot less damage after the teleport attack, Vasa will begin to throw rocks at you like a child. Uh, the protect from range will significantly lower the damage you take from the rocks, but they're not going to protect you 100%, so you need to make sure that you keep running. He's aiming the rocks at you, so run after every attack. You can land some Dragon Warhammer specs or a BGS spec if that's what you've got. Vasa does heal up a little bit of defense while he's at the crystals, but it is still helpful to lower his defense. So while you're using range on Vasa, it is important to slowly make your way over to the crystal that Vasa is headed to while you attack him. That way you're doing as much damage as possible to Vasa, but you're also on the crystal as soon as possible once it's vulnerable. It is very important to use a stab weapon on this crystal. That being said, on my hardcore Iron Man, I don't have a good stab weapon because I'm a wuss who hasn't done any Zami, Sire, or even Worms for like a dragon sword apparently. So I've been using an Abyssal Tentacle instead, and I did manage to get the stop, drop, and roll achievement on a solo Vasa, which means that the tentacle isn't useless, it still worked, but trust me, you really should use a stab weapon. Do what you can to get a decent one. The Grazi Rapier is the best stab weapon in the game, but if you're bringing a Dragon Hunter Lance for Ulm, that could be used instead. It won't be as good, but it still will work fine. The Zami Hasta has the same stab bonus as the Dragon Hunter Lance, but a little bit more strength, so if you're rocking that instead of a Lance, it'll still work. From there, the Abyssal Dagger is a good option, and the Dragon Sword is generally like the worst case scenario for most players. So you want to knock out the Crystal as soon as possible and start attacking Vasa again. Each time Vasa gets to the center, you're going to notice that he pauses for a second, and then he either moves to another Crystal, or sometimes he'll use a Teleport Attack. To know whether he's using the teleport attack, it actually goes back to where you were fighting the crystal. After any teleport that Vasa uses, he will set a timer of about 40 seconds. This timer will only count down while Vasa is healing on the crystal though, and it will only reset to 40 after he uses another teleport attack. So if he teleports the team, walks over to a crystal, and then he heals on that crystal for 15 seconds before the team kills it, then there will still be 25 seconds on that timer. Now let's say Vasa gets to the next crystal and it took you 20 seconds to KO that one, there's only 5 seconds left on that timer. So if Vasa gets to the next crystal, you only have 5 seconds to KO it. Once the timer hits 0, Vasa's automatically going to KO the crystal himself and start walking back to the middle. This means he is going to use the teleport attack. 
After the teleport attack happens, the timer resets to 40 and the process starts over. So I don't really like keep track of the 40 second timer on the dot. I just kind of eyeball it really. Generally, you can KO two crystals in between each teleport attack as long as the team is all on the crystal pretty quickly. Sometimes you'll get a third one, but if the two crystals weren't like really fast, then it's not even worth switching to your melee gear and attempting to fight the third one. So you do switch back and forth from your melee and your range gear a lot. In general, a lot of the fight is spent at kind of low health and it is a pretty click intensive fight, but it's more fun that way as long as things are going well to be fair. Vasa also drops uh, two Xerix aids, five in darkened juice, and then a couple of twisted potions which often aren't that useful but they do work as ranging potions. Plus if you end up having to make overloads later I guess you don't have to make these to put in the overload. For the next boss, we are talking about Tecton. Tecton can be a frustrating boss kind of early on. Anytime that a boss can heal up, it does mean that you can find yourself like all the way at the beginning of the fight again if you mess up too much. And of course, that can be very frustrating. When you enter the room, Tecton will be working on his anvil. The fight will not start until somebody approaches Tecton. Then he's going to notice people in the room and he'll target one of them. He'll slowly walk out to that person and he'll only begin attacking when he has reached them or if somebody else attacks him first. Tecton will swing at the players around him for a while until he returns to his anvil. When when he's at the anvil this time, sparks will occasionally fly out and hit players, so you have to keep your feet moving. Also, the vents in the corners of the room will damage you, so make sure that you keep your feet moving, but away from those. Tecton will also heal a little bit while he's on the anvil, and as soon as he walks back out like he did the first time, the process repeats until you kill him. When Tecton is walking away from his anvil, it's important to let him walk as far back in the room as possible. That way, when he returns to the anvil, since he's walking really slow, players are going to have more time to do a little bit of extra damage. Also, when Tecton walks out from the anvil, be careful not to be standing under him when he finally attacks whoever he is targeting. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck under Tecton for the entire phase, and your whole team's going to laugh at you. The Tecton only uses melee, and he is weak to crush, like very weak to crush. Only use crush weapons. Uh, there's a lot of crush weapon options. If you're rocking a scythe, you can throw that on crush. It's going to beat Tecton up. If you brought a Dragon Hunter Lance for Ulm, you can switch that over to crush. Or if you're still on a Zami Hasta, that is a very solid crush weapon too. An Elder Maul is pretty slow, but it's very accurate against him, and I've even been using the Cudgel on my hardcore Iron Man, and it does get the job done pretty well, especially if you're landing specs. A Dragon Warhammer or a BGS spec is pretty much required to fight Tecton. They both have specs that lower his defense, but with Tecton, unlike any other boss, these weapons still lower his defense even if they miss. The Dragon Warhammer will lower his defense by 5% if it hits a 0 rather than the typical 30%, and the BGS will still lower 5 levels when it hits a 0, where it usually lowers depending on how hard it hits. Tecton fights can be very slow if nobody lands a spec. When you first enter Tecton's room, he will have the orange glow under him right away, which means he's in his weaker phase, so you want to dump your specs immediately. If the fight goes long enough that you regen the spec energy and you want to use another, wait until he goes orange to use it. Tecton has much higher defense when he's in his red enraged phase. Every time that Tecton comes off the anvil after sparks were flying off of it, he will start in that enraged phase. Tecton uses melee attacks, but you can actually move out of the way of those melee attacks before they hit you. It is important to be standing within hittable range when Tecton starts his attack or he's gonna walk back to the anvil if he doesn't see anybody to attack he walks back but if you keep your feet moving around him counterclockwise he will constantly be trying to catch up to you with those attacks just try to make sure that you hit tecton right on his corner not one square in that way, when you run around him, you're never going to be running on this square here, any of these corner squares. If you're standing on any of the corner squares when he goes to attack you, he will not be able to see you and he'll walk back. In a team, it's pretty rare that every player happens to mess this up and be out of attack range, sending him back early. And you can also just pull a little step back and attack method if Tecton is too busy following the rest of the team around. When you first start learning Tecton, you'll probably take a lot of unnecessary damage from sparks in between phases, and if you're not doing the run very well at the gate, you'll take some hits from Tecton. But in the long run, you should be able to get through this room without taking any damage, just some prayer points and stamina. In fact, the better you get at Tecton, you can reduce your stamina a little bit more, and you can stop using Protect from Melee altogether, which means you're only using Piety for that prayer point drain. Tecton will drop two strong overloads, one strong prayer enhance, and one strong revitalization. Also, five stinkhorn mushrooms. As I said with the muted isles, this can set you up to not have to make any overloads. Also, those five stinkhorn mushrooms, though, it should be all you need if you happen to be doing a solo, or maybe the whole team is set up to do, like, no prep ohm. It doesn't seem like a lot of supplies, but it goes a long way. Now we're moving on to the big bad bug, Vespula. This boss, similar to Vasa, is one of my surprise favorites. I don't know how many times that I've straight up wiped on a raid, just gave up before it was over, not getting any rewards. It hasn't been a whole lot since I would rather finish the raid with some points than not finish at all, but 90% of the time that I have wiped, it's because of this room, I swear. 
A lot of that really was only because the original design for how to beat Vespula kind of blows. In general, here's how the fight goes. You don't actually kill Vespula. You have to kill the Abyssal Portal. Then you're done with the room. Anytime that you attack the portal, Vespula is going to attack you pretty rapidly. So instead, if you attack Vespula, she drops to the ground at about 20% health. And then you get a few seconds to attack the portal without taking any damage from her. You'll eventually rise back up. You start the process over. It's a crap way to do it. Instead, you can just run back and forth and attack like you see me doing here. Uh, if you attack the portal and you tank Vespula's rapid range hits, then you actually survive with your redemption prayer as long as you have 90 plus hit points. You can hit up to a 9 with it. If you're lower than 90 hit points, this method is not going to work. You do have to force her into using only her range attack, but that just means that you have to stand in the right spot when you do it. So there are four grubs in the room that we'll talk more about in a minute, but if you just stand in the middle of all those grubs, Vespula will target you. So you want to start from one square outside the grubs. This square right here next to this grub. Sometimes it'll be on the right side instead of the left, but it is pretty easy to tell where you stand. If you attack from here, your character is going to run into attack, and then you can run back to the same spot. You're only ever going to get hit by range attacks if you do this on the correct squares. If she ever hits you with a 10 or higher, you're not doing it on the right spot. There's only a few weapon choices for this room that are viable, and that's part of the reason that this room gets skipped a lot. If you don't have 90 plus hit points and a solid gear setter for this room, then it kind of blows, honestly. The Bow of Ferdin is actually better against the portal than the T-Bow, mostly because it's a 4 tick weapen. With the T-Bow, you have to wait back a little bit longer, which gives Vespula more time to attack the Grubs. The Dragon Hunter crossbow is the next best viable range weapon, but you do have to have it on long range for it to work. If you're not rocking any range weapons, you want to do this room with a mage setup. The Harmonized Nightmare Staff is actually the best in slot weapon for the portal at the moment, though I think that's going to be surpassed by the Shadow of Tumekin coming out with Raids 3 this month. After that, the Sanguine ST is still very good, and the Trident can get the job done, and not by a lot at this point. If you don't have nearly maxed out mage gear to go with your mage weapon, the portal is going to be kind of tough. Bare minimum gear in this room can be a little bit sketchy. If the fight takes any longer than it really needs, to. It uses a lot more prayer potions, and Vespula also gets more time to potentially spawn her soldiers from the grubs, which is the worst case scenario. If you have ever wooks walked at Vorkath with a Dragon Hunter Lance, then you already know the timing on this one. You have to click every other tick. Attack the portal, run back. Attack the portal, run back. Even if you happen to wait one extra tick before you attack the portal again, it does make a big difference in the long run, so it helps to get a pretty smooth motion going in. You have to make sure that you're always using Redemption when you go running in, though. When your Redemption heals you, you have to sip a prayer potion and turn your prayers back on pretty quickly. If you have a prayer enhanced though, you can just wait for the auto restore to redemption back again. This is insanely convenient, but you also might find yourself standing back a little bit, so it helps to sip a prayer potion and get right back in there sometimes. I try not to do the Vespula room unless I already have a prayer enhanced. Uh, if that's not the case, I usually bring extra prayer potions because you do use a lot of prayer in here. Let's go ahead and talk about those grubs that Vespula is attacking. When the grubs hit zero health, a soldier is going to spawn from them. These soldiers rapidly heal Vespula and the portal. This is what makes me have to wipe. Honestly, it's the worst thing, dude. If these things spawn, the whole fight's kind of screwed. You have to kill them before you can start fighting the portal again. If you're in a solo or even a two-man team, as long as you're both rocking solid gear, you do not have to worry about the grubs. You'll be quick enough on killing the portal. If you have three or more players, though, it's going to take too long, and she's going to kill the grubs a lot faster. You have to have at least one of your team members focused on the grubs. And by focus on the grubs, I mean focus on healing them. You can pick these blossoms from deeper in the room and use the herb to heal up the grubs. You should have one of your three team members pretty much solely dedicated to this. A professional healer is going to be able to throw down some attacks occasionally on the portal on the way by, but healing the the grubs is the number one priority. Whoever has the healing role in the team, make sure to empty some inventory spaces so that you can fill up on grubs and help the team out. If everything is going well in this fight, it actually didn't take that long to kill the Abyssal Portal. This is one of the faster rooms in the raid. Once the Abyssal Portal goes down, you can move on to the next room. It'll also drop two Xerix Aid Plus, one Revitalization Plus, and a Prayer Enhance Plus. Finally, let's talk about the Vanguards. This room is probably the most pain in the ass room on paper, but overall it is very engaging and you get a ridiculous amount of potions out of it. I do skip Vanguards more than any other room, mostly because it's annoying to do, but also because it tends to be pretty slow. It's very worth getting good at this room though, as it is one of the more beneficial rooms in the raid. There are three Vanguards, one for each attack style, and they spawn in sort of the corners of the room. Once you enter the room, they're gonna pop up from those little spots on the ground. Every 15 seconds or so, the Vanguards will drop back down and shuffle up. During this time, if you stand on one of those spots, you will take damage. The main thing about vanguards is that you have to kill them somewhat simultaneously. If one vanguard takes a lot more damage than another, all three of them are going to fully heal, which is not fun. If you have a team of five or more, then they can have a difference of more than 33% in health. In other words, if one of them has 90% health left and you get a different one to under 57% health left, everybody fully heals. If you're on a team of four or less, then you get up to a 40% gap, so it's a little bit easier with smaller teams. So just basically, you want to do even amounts of damage to all three 
three of them. Having a very high max hit in this room can be dangerous, but higher accuracy is extremely helpful. You can see these little brackets on their health bar to see how low that their health can get at the moment. This is very convenient to use. Like I said, there are three vanguards, one magic, one melee, and one range. Uh, the ranger has a pile of rocks in front of him, so it's easy to remember that he's throwing rocks. The melee guy has tentacles, and he whips you with them. The ranger does have tentacles too, but you just remember the one without the rocks is the melee, and that just leaves the one with no tentacles to be the major. Your weaknesses go by the combat triangle. The major is weak to range, the melee is weak to magic, and the ranger is weak to melee, specifically stab. I will say the Bofa kinda cranks. If you're having any trouble in this room catching up on healing and switching gear, paying attention to all their health, you could just stick to your range gear for a little bit if you're rocking the Bow of Ferriden. This used to be the case for the Blowpipe, really not quite as much after the nerf though. With a three-man team, this is a pretty simple setup for the Vanguards. The best way to do it is putting one guy in each of those three spots that they move to, and then each person attacks whichever Vanguard is on them while making sure not to push its health too low. Another strategy would be to assign each team member to a Vanguard uh, so that you only have to fight one of them and not switch your gear, and you can follow that one around. It is faster to stay in each corner and just switch your gear depending on which one is headed to you. Plus, you can take extra damage if you run under the Vanguards while they're moving, so staying in a corner is safe. If you stand far enough into the corner of the room while you're attacking the melee, he's not going to be able to see you, so it's kind of like a safe spot. Also, if you stand under the ranger, it will not kite around to try to attack you. So if you need to heal up while the ranger is hitting you, or you need to stop hitting the ranger because it's getting too low on health, you can just stand under it to be safe. That means that the major is the most dangerous one in the room. All three of them can hit through your protection prayers, but those overheads still reduce the damage that you take, so it's important to use them. Your offensive prayers like Rigor and Piety are not as good in here since they raise your max hit, and that is dangerous. Once you get them all under 40% health, or 33% health if you're in a big team, then you can just KO the van Vanguards, and when all three of them are down, you can move on to the next room. Vanguards do drop a ton of potions. Each one of them will drop a strong combat potion for whichever attack style that it was using, and one to two Xerix aids. Each of them also has a chance to drop one Overload and one Revitalization, which is like a Super Restore. Uh, you are guaranteed to get at least one Overload from them, but you're not guaranteed to get any Revitalizations. Now let's talk about preparing for the Ulm fight, which is basically just making potions. A really good raid will often not require any preparation before Ulm, otherwise known as a no prep, but that's not always doable, especially while you're learning raids. I'm going to first go over all the mechanics for farming and making potions here, then we're going to run it back as a team process so that you and your homies can go through the potions as fast as possible. This is the farming room. In this room, you're going to be able to farm herbs, collect gourds, and fill them with water, which is the same as getting vials of water. You can even catch fish and bats, but that's, that's really a waste of time. You just want to make potions. There's four potions that you want during an Ulm fight. First, we have the Xerix Aids and the Revitalization potions. These are your Ceridoman Brews and your Super Restores. They're even colored the same way. To make a strong brew and restore, you do need 78 Herb Lore. Uh, the other two potions that you need are an Overload and a Prayer Enhance. The Overload is for boosting your combat stats, and the Prayer Enhance will slowly heal prayer points over time. You do need 78 Herb Lore to make the strong Prayer Enhance, but you need 90 Herb Lore for the strong Overloads, which is why it's important to have at least one teammate with 90 Herb Lore. You can potentially skip making Overloads and Enhances if you had boss bosses that already dropped those potions for you, like Tecton, Muted Isles, or Vanguards, so that does help to scout raids that'll do that for you. Let's talk about how to make these potions and then how many of them you might need. Just like any other potion, you need a vial of water, an herb, and a secondary ingredient. Like I said, you can get the gourds in the farming room. They can be filled up with the geyser or with the humidify spell. The herbs are going to be grown in the farming room too, though you're going to need to get the seeds from other rooms. Seeds can be obtained from either monster drops like mystics or guardians, or you can take a rake to the end of the first floor or the second floor and rake some seeds from this patch. This is usually the worst case scenario having a rake for seeds, but it does happen. A rake, a spade, and a seed dibber can be found in the farming room. The seed dibber is needed for planting the seed, and the spade is needed for actually harvesting the plant. There are three different types of herbs, bukus, gulpars, and noxifers. Bukus, often said as buchus, rather, uh, they are used for brews, restores, and prayer enhances. So you mostly need bukus. That's like 90% of the herbs that you're growing. You also need gulpar and noxifer if you're making overloads. You can make an anti-poison with noxifers, but you shouldn't really ever have to make one of those unless you've made a mistake. So you don't make unfinished potions like you do in the regular game. You need both the herb and the secondary ingredient on you, and you fill them into the gourd at the same time. So let's talk about getting those secondaries for potions. Secondary ingredients can be gathered by killing scavengers in one of those scavenger rooms. These things 
things have a few different helpful drops that can be used around the raid, like an axe, a pickaxe, or lock picks. But the main thing that you need is secondaries for your potions and then planks to make a bigger chest for the team. The secondaries for your potions are in darkened juice, the stinkhorn mushrooms, and Sicily. When combined with Buku's, you can get Xerix aid with the juice, revitalizations with the shrooms, and a prayer enhance with the Sicily. So if you only need brews and restores, then you only need juice and shrooms. Since you likely will be making more brews than anything else, you likely need to collect mostly in darkened juice. To make an overload, you do need all three secondaries, one of each. Let's go ahead and talk about those overloads quickly. The overload is a combination of the other three combat potions that can be made within the chambers. To make these three potions, you need Golpars and those secondaries we were just talking about. A Golpar plus a Stinkhorn Mushroom makes an Elder Potion, which will boost your attack, defense, and strength, just like a super combat. A Golpar and Sicily will make a Twisted Potion, which is like a Ranging Potion. And then Golpar plus in Darkened Juice will make a Kodai Potion, which raises your magic level. The strong versions of these potions can be made with 70 Herb Lore, but it requires 90 Herb Lore to use a Noxifer on all three potions and combine it into an Overload Plus. With lower Herb Lore, you can make weaker Overloads, which does make a big difference during the Ulm fight, though. You want the strong Overload. The overload is better than using the other three potions for a few reasons. For one, it's all three potions in one inventory space, which gives you more room for brews, but also it works differently than the other potions. First of all, you need to have over 50 hit points to sip an overload, because it's going to hit you for 10 damage five different times right after you drink it. After five minutes, though, when the overload effect is over, you do get those 50 hit points back. During those five minutes, every 15 seconds, the overload is going to reboost your stats. So if you sip the Xerix Aid, which lowers your stat, just like a Ceridoman Brew would, they will be boosted boosted back up rather than having to resip your revitalization potions or resip like a super combat and stuff like that. In fact, if you were to heal up right at the 15 second mark, like 15, 30, 45, or right at the minute mark for your overload, then your stats will immediately be boosted back up and you won't lose any DPS. Let's go ahead and run down that preparation process now that you know all the mechanics. You're going to need to kill scavengers for secondary, so send one team member to do that, or two if you're on a large team, like five plus. Uh, generally, you can send the Iron Men to do this if you have them on a team, even though Iron Men can't take anybody else's supplies, they can gather secondaries for the full team. The amount of secondaries that you need depends on how many team members that you have and how good your team members are, to be fair. A more experienced player will need less brews and restores. Something like 8 juice, 4 shrooms, and 2 Sicily per person is a good place to start. You can grab even less potions if you have potions left over from like the bosses and stuff like that, and as you're getting better at the raid, you're going to need less brews. The player grabbing secondaries should also grab a couple of planks for the team to make a shared storage chest. While one team member is getting secondaries, the others should start planting seeds and collecting gourds. It's kind of a pain to collect gourds before you get planks, so it helps if somebody goes and at least grabs two planks off of the guy collecting secondaries. If you need to make overloads, then I suggest planting the Golpur and the Noxifer first, so you can get that done right away. Uh, remember, for each overload, you need three Golpars and one Noxifer. Once you have enough overload herbs, you can plant the Bukus instead and harvest as many Bukus as you might need, anywhere from 10 to 15 per person for the Ulm fight. By the time that you have harvested your overload herbs and you start getting some bukus your teammates that are working on the secondaries should probably be back by then so you can start actually making potions Here's what my inventory looks like going into an Ulm fight. I've slowly been bringing less brews with me and more switches. More often than not, I've had a few extra brews lately, but it's even helpful to have a few extra brews because you could drop those on the ground for anybody else who happens to need them in the middle of the fight. If you still have any questions about preparing for the Ulm fight, let me know in the comments section. Finally, it's time to go over the Ulm fight. The Great Ulm has a lot of different attacks, which makes the fight very hectic if things are not going well. The more that I sit here and just list off the possible attacks you can use, the more ridiculous that it may seem. There is so much to focus on. But the more that you fight Ulm, the more you're going to realize it's really not quite the case. With a solid team, you can skip a large portion of these attacks, and the fight can actually go very quickly if you're all rocking solid gear, too. First of all, let's go over the basic idea of an Ulm fight. He's going to spawn on one side of the room, peeking his head and two claws out of the hole in the ground. Ulm's right claw claw needs to be killed with magic and his left claw needs to be killed with melee. Keep in mind when you're looking at Ohm, the claw here on the left, that is his right claw. So it might be easier to just notice the one that you can reach with melee, that one you have to use melee. The one that you can't reach with melee, you have to use magic on that one. During the first few phases of the fight, you won't be able to fight his head quite yet, only the claws. The amount of phases in the fight does depend on how many players in the raid. If you have a team of one to seven players though, you're only going to have three claw phases then a head phase. You generally have to kill the Magic Claw before the Melee Claw, because on the first two phases, Ulm is going to pull back his Melee Claw if it takes too much damage, forcing you to attack the Mage Claw. Once the Mage Claw is KO'd, the Melee Claw will no longer cripple up for that phase. 
When you KO both claws, that's going to end the claw phase. Olm's going to drop back down in his hole, and in like 15 seconds, he'll pop back up on the other side. During this time, crystals will constantly be dropping from the ceiling. These hit a 3x3 three three area, so don't stand next to them or you're going to take some good damage. Olm will pop back up. You KO both claws again. He'll drop back down. You gotta dodge the crystals again, and then he'll pop back up on the original side for his third phase, the last claw phase, unless you have a very large team. The way that you can tell the difference in this phase, you're gonna notice that his head has that little green glow to it. If his head is glowing like that, then you have to KO both claws at the same time here. When one claw is killed, it's gonna go down and a timer bar is gonna spawn above it. If the other claw is not killed before this timer runs out, then the first claw will respawn. You have about a 10 second gap to get the KO on both of them, which is not that difficult to obtain with just a little bit of coordination. The melee claw will not recoil back when it takes too much damage during the third phase. If you manage to KO both claws in time, you're now going to head over to head phase, and crystals will begin to fall from the ceiling like they did before. You just have to attack Olm's head with range. Once you KO his head, you've completed the raid, and you can go get your rewards. Let's get a little more specific about the mechanics during the fight. First, we're going to talk about turning Olm's head. You're going to notice that Olm looks in three different directions during the fight. The area that Olm is looking at is where Olm is going to use his attack, which means if you're not standing in the area that he's looking at, you won't be attacked by the great Olm. Olm is smart enough to look for players that are hiding from him, though, so when he attacks, he will also turn his head to look at the area with the most players. So if we look at more of a bird's eye view of the arena real quick, we can highlight the three areas. I know that you can't see Ulm right now. We'll uh, we'll put a little Ulm picture so you can see if he was standing on this side. If Ulm is looking towards his mage claw, then this is the area that he can currently see, and that's where he will attack next. If Ulm is currently looking towards his melee claw, this is the area that he can see. And then if Ulm is looking straight down the middle, then this is all the area that he's going to be able to see for the next attack. So let's narrow those down to a couple of markers on the ground here. Uh, this marker by the mage hand that shows me how far over you have to be to not be seen if he's looking at the middle. These two spots in the middle show where you have to stand to be hidden on the left or the right. So if he's looking over by the mage hand, you can just stand on this spot on the right, you'll be safe. If he's looking at the melee hand, you can stand on this spot on the left, you're going to be safe. And then this spot all the way over by the melee hand, this shows where you would be safe even if Ulm is looking to the middle. I do have an extra spot right here for Ulm's thumb. This is not necessarily needed for turning the head, but it is a good spot to know during the fight. That's the basic idea of the head turning mechanics. Let's just look at running back and forth for a second real quick. As you can see here, as long as nobody is in the area that Ulm is currently looking at when he goes to attack, no attack is going to come out and all he's going to do is turn his head. This is a little bit more simple to see when there's just one person here running back and forth. Uh, we're going to go over the three different roles for fighting Ulm and how those work together to turn his head after we talk about his attacks. So Ulm has a lot of attacks. He will be attacking every four ticks, the same pace as like a whip or a dragon hunter lance. The majority of them can only be used at certain times in the fight. So it's not like you have to be ready to react to every single attack at any moment. A few attacks can be used at any time though. First of all, he has his auto attacks. Very simply, he can use magic and range. He'll only use one one at a time though and you can't predict which one he's going to use you do just want to switch your overhead to the attack style that you saw him use most recently the big green blob is a magic attack and the little green rock is his range attack the other attack that Ulm can use at any time are the prayer orbs, or the spheres rather. Ulm will send out some spheres, either a red, purple, or green sphere. The red is for melee, the purple is for magic, and the green one is for range. It's also going to tell you in your chat which one is coming for you, which is convenient if he throws a couple of them out there. They won't say like melee, range, or magic necessarily. It's a sphere of aggression, a sphere of magical power, and a sphere of accuracy and dexterity. They will be color-coded in the chat though, so you don't even actually have to see the spheres at all. You can just check your chat. When the attack is used, it's going to drain your prayer points cutting them in half so it's actually beneficial to keep your prayer points low during the fight so you don't lose as many during this attack and you also have to turn on your protect from whatever attack style is correlated to the sphere coming at you if you don't protect from the sphere it does cut your health in half all of the other attacks that Ulm has only can be used at certain times so they would all be considered like special attacks but there's three special attacks that are the most important to pay attention to so when I'm referring to quote unquote Ulm special attacks I'm talking about these three the lightning teleport and crystals the lightning attack is going to spawn lightning at the ends of the room, which will slowly travel all the way across the arena. If you get hit by this lightning, it's going to do a little bit of damage. It's going to freeze you in place for a couple seconds and disable your overhead prayers. Try to step out of the way of the lightning. The teleport attack will assign another player in the room to you, and the two of you have to stand on the same tile as soon as possible, or you're going to swap places and take damage. The further away you are from each other when you swap, the more damage it's going to do. If there's an odd number of players in the fight, then one of them won't be picked unless you are soloing. If you're solo, then you're just assigned a 
random tile in the room that you have to get to. The most common strategy here is to just meet at the same tile, and most teams have decided that meeting at the thumb that we talked about highlighting before is the best place to meet. Finally, we have the Crystal Burst. Olm is going to spawn some crystals at your feet, and then the next time he attacks, those crystals will grow rapidly. If you're still standing on that same spot that they spawned on, they're going to shove you to the side and do some thick damage, like 30 to 40 plus. So we've got Lightning, Teleport, Crystals. Lightning, Teleport, Crystals. Don't forget the order of those attacks and be paying attention to them in general. Ulm attacks every four ticks, and every four attacks, he's going to use one of these three specs, and he always uses them in the same order. So if you see a Lightning attack, Four attacks later will be a teleport. Four attacks after that, crystals. Four attacks after that, lightning. Four attacks after that, I, I think you're starting to get it. Like most other attacks, Ulm is not going to use these specials if he happens to be turning his head and the area that he was looking at it had nobody in it. That's why when I run back and forth like this, you never see a lightning, a teleport, or a crystal attack. In a team setting, even if Ulm happens to be turning his head when he uses a spec, if there's still one person in the area that he looked away from, he will use the lightning, the teleport, or the crystals. If that person left over happens to run along with the head, you can skip these special attacks. This is known as a mage skip or a a melee skip depending on which side needs to do the running and I will be talking a little bit more about that when we talk about the roles that each teammate has during Ulm right now we're just going over how the attacks work lightning teleport crystals don't forget those they can be used during any hand phase but they will not be used during the final stand head phase when you get to the third head phase when you're supposed to KO the two claws at the same time there will be an added healing spec in between the teleport and crystals attack it's still on the same pattern as before so every four attacks there'll be a spec but now there's four of them in line instead of just three of them. The melee hand will no longer cripple up when you hit it during this hand phase too, so it's actually a little bit better for the melee hand here, but make sure to not attack it while it is healing, otherwise all damage that you do will heal the claw instead. You will notice on the first two hand phases when Ulm rises out of his hole, it will mention that he rises with a certain power. The power of flame, the power of acid, or the power of crystal. This will determine the two different phase attacks that Ulm can use during that phase. When Ulm rises with the power of fire, he can use the flame wall or the good old burn with me. The flame wall is going to trap some players in, you guessed it, a wall of flames. Somebody just needs to cast a water spell in the flames for anybody trapped to get out. It can even be the person in the flames. If you have a water spell, you can get yourself out of it. Humidify does count as a water spell for this and you don't even actually have to use the spell on the flames just click on one of the flames as soon as possible if the player trapped in the flame doesn't get out in time they're going to take like 50 to 60 damage for it make sure you get at least one person on the team that has water spells before entering the raid so you don't get screwed by this the burn with me attack is way worse than the flame wall once you are inflicted you will take five damage and your stats will be drained by two every few ticks six total times so you're going to take 30 total damage and a constant drain of your stats which is not good for dps also you can spread the burn just like you can spread the cough at next you just make sure not to stand close to any other players while you have the burn if you get the burn and you have been assigned to another player that is teleporting there is always time to just run in two squares not get hit by the teleport and then run back out before you burn your teammate but you do have to hustle when Ulm rises with the power of acid, you have to deal with the acid spray and the acid drip. The acid spray is really nothing. He's just going to throw down some acid spots on the ground that you need to avoid or you'll take poison damage. The acid drip, on the other hand, a lot worse. He's going to target you with an acid drip that'll just follow you around. You need to start moving. Anytime you're standing still, you'll take a lot of damage. And it'll take a while for those spots to disappear. So you can't really, like, repeat spots that you walked on. It does help to walk it out for this instead of having your run energy on so that you cover less spots in acid. Finally, if the Great Olm comes up in the Crystal phase, then he can use the Falling Crystals or the Crystal Bombs. The Falling Crystals work similar to the Acid Drip. Uh, crystals are going to fall from the ceiling on the square that you are standing on, but they deal up to 20 damage. This is a little bit easier to dodge than the Acid since it doesn't leave a spot where you can't stand for a while. You just need to step out of the way of the Crystals. The Crystal Bombs are very easy to dodge. He's just going to toss two Crystal Bombs out in the room, and a couple attacks later, they'll explode. They hit like an area of effect, and the closer you are to the bomb, the more damage it does. Unfortunately for us, during the third claw phase, when you have to KO both claws at the same time, Ohm will have the power of all three phases, so you have to be aware of all of these attacks. Once you have KO'd both hands at the same time and sent Ulm to his head phase, Ulm will no longer be able to use the lightning, teleport, and crystal attacks, but he can still use all of those phase-specific attacks we were talking about. He will also add a blue pool attack now. He's going to launch two blue pools out into the room, and in a few seconds, anybody who is not standing on one of those pools is going to take up to 19 damage, and Ulm is going to heal for five times whatever damage they were hit for. So if a few players don't manage to land on the pool in time, Ulm could heal for like a few hundred health. It is very important to get to the pools, but if you're rocking a T or a dragon hunter crossbow for head phase you make up for that healing pretty quickly that is it those are all of Ulm's attacks just having to react to them randomly does make the fight very difficult but we've already discussed a little bit how to skip some attacks
attacks and the fact that there are patterns to them. So let's talk about the different roles that each team member should have during the Ulm fight and how those roles work together to skip more attacks. So there are three roles for your team as long as we're talking about a fight with three or more people. In a solo or even a duo, you have to run the head a lot differently. That's where you hear the terms 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 4 0, and stuff like that. That's going to be a different guide for me. Right now, we're discussing the team Ulm fight. One player should be assigned the mage hand, one player should be assigned the melee hand, and then every other player is a head runner. If the major makes sure to stay all the way on his mark square or anywhere further to the left, and then the melee stays like on the pinky or anywhere further to the right, then the head runners only have to move those two squares in the middle to be able to turn the head. So an ideal Ohm fight will have Ohm's head turning back and forth every other attack. This means the major will be hit every fourth attack, and the melee will only be hit every fourth attack, and then all the head runners should never be hit by an attack as long as you're doing this right. Not until you have to all pile the melee hand at least. Remember in the first two claw phases, the melee hand cripples up when it takes too much damage, so the mage hand is going to be the one to get KO'd first. Once that happens, everyone piles the melee hand, and running the head is no longer a thing for the rest of that phase. Let's look at a quick visual of what each of the three roles are doing, starting with the head runners. All the head runners are doing are running back and forth on two squares to keep turning Ulm's head. Currently, you're looking at the group of players in the middle of the arena, not me standing by the mage hand. So they can attack the mage hand twice at each spot and then move. As long as you're not standing in the area that Ulm is looking when he attacks or turns his head, the head runner should be taking zero damage while they do this, and they can keep their overhead prayers off, so they use less prayer points. On the surface, running the head sounds like the more complicated thing than just standing at one of the two hands and attacking, but there are some skips involved with the players and the hand rolls, so it's actually a little more complicated there. Plus, the head runners take less damage, so it is beneficial to put your newer raiders on the head running squad. Each phase, the head runners, along with anybody else, should dump a Dragon Warhammer or BGS spec on the melee hand as it starts, but then you're using magic to attack the Mage Claw, only switching back to melee once the Mage Claw is KO'd. When the Mage Claw gets knocked out, everybody can pile the melee claw, and then the rolls don't matter anymore until the next phase. If you're ever running the head in a group, and the group gets a little mixed up, and some people are on different sides of the head, to decide where everybody should meet up, you just have to look at where the head is staring right now. You have to go to the opposite side of it. If he's currently looking right in the middle, then that might take a little bit more coordination. In general, if it was you that messed up the timing and you see other players still have the timing going correctly, just try to catch back up to them. Let's move over to me on the mage hand. It is important to stay on the far side of the mage hand using the tile that we marked earlier. As long as you always stay on that side of the arena, you're not going to mess up the head runners at all. If you accidentally step too close to his head, sometimes you're going to force the head to look into the middle and the runners are going to tank some damage. If you're on the mage roll, then you're not going to have to switch your gear at all until the mage hand is down so other than focusing on Ulm's attacks each time that he hits you your only job is to skip the special attack remember lightning teleport and crystals if your team is getting hit by those attacks but the head runners are all running the head correctly then it's up to either the melee hand or the mage hand to skip those specs and here's how to do it on the mage hand you're gonna notice when the head is running correctly that it's a very simple pattern he's gonna attack once turn to the other side attack once turn back to where he was looking and repeat the process this is a four attack cycle for Ulm, so that means means he'll always be using the lightning teleport or crystal special attack on the same point in that cycle. So if Ulm uses one of those special attacks or the healing attack on phase three while he's looking away from you, that's when you know that you had to skip it. So as you can see here, Ulm has started using his crystal burst attack. These crystals are going to pop up out of the ground very soon, but also the head runners have done, or the head runner I should say, has done his job correctly and Ulm's head is currently turning away from me. So that means enough players were on the other side of the arena but he still used the spec. If zero players were in his line of sight when he went to turn his head there, he would not have used that special attack. So as long as the major makes their way over to the other side along with the head runners there, no player will be over there when Ulm attacks and he won't be able to use this special attack. Let's go ahead and look at this again. Ulm's head turns towards me. I tank one hit, and then I make sure I'm on the other side of his head for the next hit, and no special attack came out. You do have to tank that one hit beforehand. You can't just make your way over to the other side early, or else the head will turn too early. Other than skipping those specs, the mage roll really doesn't have that much to do, and honestly, just running over there for that mage skip is super easy, so the mage roll is not that bad. Once the mage hand goes down, switch over to your melee gear and help pile the melee claw. Finally, let's talk about the melee hand, which is a little bit more complicated than being the player on the mage hand for two reasons. First of all, you're going to remember that Ulm cripples his 
hand up when you do too much melee damage. That means the melee cannot attack the whole time, and it is a waste of time to just stand there. So their job is to switch over to magic gear and get some mage damage while the hand is recoiled back. You have to stand on this side though, remember, or else you're going to be messing up with the head runners, just like how the mage has to stand all the way on their side. For this reason, you have to set your staff to long range. If you don't set your staff to long range, you won't be able to reach from this spot, you'll go running in, and you will mess up the head runners. When the melee hand is back and you're able to attack it, you want to make sure to do as much melee damage as you can. Everybody is going to be piling the melee claw once the mage claw is out, but once that happens, the team is no longer able to run the head until that melee claw is KO'd. So if the melee claw is already very low on health when the team piles it, they're going to be taking less damage overall during that part. Skipping the lightning, teleport, and crystals with the melee roll is the same as it is with the mage roll. If Ulm uses a special attack as he is looking away from you, then you could have ran to the other side to skip it. You need to make sure that you tank that hit before that so you don't turn his head too early, and then step over to the other side before he does turn, and the special attack will be skipped. This can be a little bit more complicated to do while you're attacking with melee, since you have to be right up next to the claw to use melee. Overall, it's not that hard to pull off, though, and it is going to save the team a lot of hassle and a lot of bruise. So the melee hand roll is a little bit more complicated than the mage hand. You have to melee the claw until it retracts. In that case, you're going to be switching over to long range magic and hitting the mage claw. And then if any special attacks happen while Ulm is looking away from you, you have to do a little bit of extra running to skip those specs. When the team KOs the magic claw, they're all going to head over to you and help you finish the melee claw. Uh, it does help if the team tries to spread out a little bit while attacking the melee claw, just in case somebody gets hit with that burn with me. I think that does wrap up everything I wanted to say about straight up Ulm mechanics. Uh, if you have any questions about how these mechanics work at this point, let me know in the comments section below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. For now though, I'm just going to throw a full team Ulm kill on the screen. That was hard to say. We're going to go over the full kill and how it looks when it's all put together. Alright, so this fight ends up being one of the better three-man Ulms that I've been a part of, even though I went in the room a little early, and now Colby's trying to catch up. Uh, I'm going to be on the mage hand, dadding over there is going to be on the melee hand, and Colby's going to be running the head. So I immediately, I dumped my spec over there on the melee hand, I'm running over here to do some magic. Uh, I can take off any melee gear, try to get some more damage out there. I only need my overheads on when Ulm's head is looking at me, so it does help to be paying attention to where's Ulm, where Ulm's head is at, excuse me. Uh, as long as your team's doing everything right, and the head runner's doing everything on time, then... You don't even really need to pay that much attention, like it's all happening in the same timing. Every fourth attack is going to hit me, so I can just turn on my overheads occasionally. And uh, it's pretty boring at this point. Occasionally we might get hit by a special attack, I'm waiting on a potential acid drip. We already saw the acid spray, you can still see in the chat that he came up with the power of acid, so... We know something's coming in hot soon, just another mage attack. Right after that mage attack too, actually, Ulm just used a spec, but he happened to look right into the middle because the melee hand over there was trying to deal with acid and he accidentally stepped a little bit too close. Uh, otherwise, we could have started doing, excuse me, uh, a mage skip right there, but the mage hand is already almost KO'd. None of these rolls really matter once the mage hand is out. So, once we finish this hand, we can put on some melee gear and go take out the melee hand. Luckily, we didn't get the acid drip or anything during the melee hand. That was pretty solid. Uh, we got to walk around for the crystals here. This is more of a pain during a solo, this phase. During a solo, you're constantly targeted by the crystals. But as you can see, like one of them hasn't dropped on my head in a little bit at this point. So I didn't have to take that many steps. Now I'm just running into them. What are we doing? Uh, you should get to the point that you're taking zero damage from these. But every once in a while, you're going to take a crystal to the head. Next phase is starting. Even though I'm the mage hand, I'm first starting off by dumping a spec real quick. And then I'm going to get my mage gear on and head as far over as possible so that the head runner, Colby, can start turning the head as soon as possible. I take off some of my other melee gear to help with mage damage. And then again, I only have to have my overhead prayers on when he's looking at me. That's just kind of a bonus for saving prayer points. You'll notice that I'm not always on top of that as I'm trying to get into a rhythm for potentially mage skipping and watching out for some specs. We are in the flame phase, so we could see a flame wall or we could see burn with me. Burn with me is pretty easy to deal with when everybody's spread out like this, but once we get over the melee hand, that's a little bit more annoying and the flame wall is not that big of a deal. So right there, he used those crystals as the head was looking towards me. That means that that special attack was used as the head was looking away from the melee hand. So technically right now, the guy on the melee hand could be skipping. The mage hand has gone down. Go ahead and put on our melee gear and head over to the melee hand, which already has some decent damage on it. So again, at this point, we're not really running the head anymore. So this is where we're going to take a little bit of extra damage. But as long as you just keep switching your overheads and you're paying attention to lightning, crystal, and teleports like I have there, you shouldn't take that much damage here. 
It is common practice to head to the thumb on the teleport attack, but with a little bit of communication, or as long as you guys are on the same page, just you and your teammate can match up like Colby and Dadding did there. You can see Colby just got the burn with me. I did my best to step in one square and take it from him. Not a good move. Lucky for me, I didn't actually take it from him. Uh, we're spread out enough on this melee hand that nobody is going to take the burn from him. It kind of sucks that he's taking damage, losing some DPS. Oh, and we get that flame wall out there too. But uh, overall, he didn't spread the burn to anybody, so that is very helpful for the team. Again, we're dodging crystals at this time. We're looking uh, for phase three. I'm tanking way too many of those crystals, but luckily we've been kicking ass in phases one and two at this point, so I happen to have some, some extra bruise lying around. Uh, we're dumping a spec here on phase three. I don't have to run immediately to the magic hand, though. You're going to see me step all the way out to the side a little bit. That was an attempt to not get hit by an attack, but I didn't even do it correctly there. Uh, in phase three, we can actually stand at this hand all the way until the teleport attack. It's no longer going to cripple up when we do too much melee damage, and after the teleport attack is when the heal happens. So it's beneficial to just do as much damage as you can on this melee hand uh, until after the teleport, and then you can go back to your normal rolls. So lightning is about to hit the wall here. We know we're about to get teleport. It's been four attacks later. Dadding's going to come over to me. I also uh, actually am the only one who doesn't have a sphere sent to me, so I was safe on that. And I can make my way over to start doing some magic. So Dadding still in the melee hand. We'll slowly get that melee hand down to a killable session. Look at these bombs around me. And we go right back to the same rotation we've been doing for running the head. Uh, as you can see, the special attacks happened as the head turned to me on that time. We'll see it again in a second. When the head turns over to me, we should get a lightning attack right here. See that? That means that technically Dadding could be running over to my side when that happens and skipping the melee attack. And he is not right now, but we still love him. If he did skip it, I wouldn't have to make this teleport run that I'm about to make, but that's not that big of a deal. Honestly, when you're using magic, you don't miss that many hits. And as long as everybody's prepped to get to the thumb, nobody takes any teleport damage. It's really not huge at all. As you can see, Dadding has crushed it when it comes to the melee hand. That thing is at, like, no health, so he really doesn't have to bother with that at all at this point. We can get this mage hand down to basically zero. You want to KO the melee hand before you KO the mage hand, preferably. That does not always happen, and it's not that big of a deal if they're both pretty much at zero health. But if you knock out the mage hand, and then you go to KO the melee hand, and the timer is going, and then the melee hand begins to heal... That is a very bad thing. So it is beneficial to KO the melee hand before the mage hand. You just want to make sure that you get the mage hand down to some pretty low health first so that you have only a couple of hits until you KO it. Alright, you see on this one that we actually KO the mage hand a little bit early and it's healing right now. Uh, a full healing session doesn't last as long as the timer. So as long as you had it low enough health, that's not going to be that big of a deal. That could have been a little sketchier than it was though. So we're now in head phase. Uh, a lot of things change in head phase. There may not be lightning, teleport, and crystals anymore, but you still want to do the head rotation. So you'll notice that I'm trying to stay on this side, even though I have the acid feet on me. Uh, and you'll notice that Colby is still running the head in the middle, and Dadding is standing all the way over on the other side. Ohm's head is still turning, and he still uses all of his regular attacks, depending on, like, where he's looking and whatnot. So as hectic as head phase gets, it is important to still be running the head back and forth. That way, you're not taking nearly as much damage. Also, if you're not uh, doing the head running, if you're on the mage or the melee hand, clearly everybody's attacking the head here. But if you were the mage or the melee roll, you still want to be walking in between your attacks, because those crystals are falling from the ceiling constantly. It's about as simple as that, though. We are just waiting to get enough damage out there, and then we go ahead and get to see... A white light, as always. So every fight can be a little different. I didn't necessarily get inflicted with, like, burn with me. I didn't get those falling crystals on that one. Uh, if you have any other questions about Ulm fights at this point, just make sure to let me know in the comments section below. That's another reason that I also try to put out some of those full raid videos so that we can get more Ulm examples out there. At this point, though, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to killing Ulm. So let's go ahead and move on to the rewards. Finally, let's talk about the rewards that you can get from the Chambers of Zarek. While you raid, you will be getting points based on how much damage that you do, and you will lose points anytime that you die, so try to be careful in here. With more players in the raid, monsters will have more health, so you do get more team points. Your personal points will affect like the amount of supplies that you get with a reward, so if you don't get a unique and you land regular loot, uh, the more points that you have, not necessarily the better the loot, but the more of it that you'll get. Uh, we're only really here for the uniques, though, but the regular loot does add up pretty well, to be fair. The team's overall points is going to decide your chance at getting a unique. When you do get a unique, the light above the chest is going to glow purple. So when you hear players like myself saying we did or didn't get a purple light, that's what we're talking about with the unique loot. 
Every 8,676 points the team gets, you have a 1% chance to get a purple light. There's no need to memorize this number, but it does help to have an idea of how rare the uniques may be. If a team gets 86,000 points, you got a 1 in 10 chance to see a purple light. The chance is capped out at a 65.7% chance once you hit 570k points. So if you get 571,000 points, you have a 65.7% chance for one unique, and then those 1k points go towards a possible second unique. Apparently, you can get up to six purple lights in one raid, but I've only ever heard of the triple purple light as far as I'm aware. That's the most I've heard of at least. More points just means that you have a better chance to get a purple light. That's just all it comes down to. Once the raid has decided that the team gets a unique, it then randomly picks a team member to get the item depending on how many individual points everybody had. So if you had 40% of the points at the end of the raid, you have a 40% chance to get the item once the team has rolled it. Getting some uniques from the Chambers of Zarek is pretty rare, so you can go dry for a little while, but the drops are pretty ridiculously priced, so it can have a very nice payday. Let's talk a little bit more specific than just the uniques. There are 12 items that you can get once you get a purple light, and they have four different tables. The most common drop table would be the prayer scrolls. The arcane prayer scroll is pretty sad to see compared to anything else, but at least the dexterous is 13 mil at the moment. After that, the Twisted Buckler and the Dragon Hunter Crossbow share a drop table. The Buckler is a pretty sick shield, and it's a little bit more expensive than getting a Dexterous, but the Dragon Hunter Crossbow is a thick drop. There's a few more items in the Chambers of Zarek that are more expensive than the Crossbow, but it is the most common of the big drops here. The next table has five items on it. We have the Din's Bulwark, the Dragon Claws, and the Ancestral pieces. At the moment, Ancestral and Dragon Claws are through the roof, mostly for anticipation for Raids 3 in general, but they are still very expensive. The Ancestral Hat is only at 17 mil, and the Dinny B is only 10 10, so those two aren't very wild, but this table is pretty solid. And then finally, we have the Mega Rare table, which has the Elder Maul, the Kodai Insignia, and the Twisted Bow. Basically, when you get a unique, it's first going to check like which table you hit, then it checks which item you get. So if you get an Elder Maul or a Kodai Insignia, you are very close to the Promised Lands. The Elder Maul is about the price of a Dexterous at the moment, so you don't really want to see one of those. The Kodai is 108 mil, which is a nice split, but the Tebow is currently over 1.1 bill, which is alright, I guess. The Tebow does fluctuate anywhere from like 1 bill to 1.2 bill over time and in general it is good to just check prices on stuff while you're trying to grind it out but the Tebow is always going to be one of the most sought out items in the game. You can also get a pet from the Chambers of Zarek. The Omelet can only be obtained when you get a purple light. Anytime that you get a purple in your name you also have a 1 in 53 chance to roll the pet. This was originally a 1 in 650 chance to roll the pet on a purple light that was reduced to 1 in 65 after nobody got the pet for the first like month that Chambers of Zarek was out. I'm not a 100% sure when they lowered it to 1 in 53. Very likely when they removed things like the Dragon Sword and the Dragon Harpoon from the drop table. Uh, that made uniques a little bit more rare. The Omelet is one of the coolest pets in the game, but also it's the most difficult to get based on average hours. Also, you can get the Metamorphic Dust from Challenge Mode Raids to make your Ulm look like other bosses from the raid, but we're going to talk about that more when I finally get a chance to knock out my Challenge Mode Raids guide. I believe that is everything that I wanted to talk about for this Chambers of Zarek guide, everybody. Like I said at the beginning of the video, the goal of this guide was to teach just all of the mechanics for the Chambers of Zarek, focusing on a team setting. I'm going to be making a quick version of this guide for anybody that wants a shorter version that clearly won't have quite as much info, but it'll be good for a rundown on how to do raids. I'm also going to be making some guide add-ons for this to be more specific for solo raids, challenge mode raids, and even running some speed runs. I also have some full raids videos that are currently linked in the description, and I plan on making even more of those videos for anybody who is looking for just straight up raids examples. The Chambers of Zarek is a lengthy subject as you can see so it's very possible that you still might have any questions about some of the specifics in here. Be sure to let me know in the comments section below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for watching my Chambers Guide everybody. If you enjoyed the video or you just got some useful information out of it be sure to like and subscribe for more content. I do stream on Twitch which should be linked on the screen and in the description so if you've been enjoying the YouTube content be sure to check me out on the Twitch side of things. I'm also on Twitter and have have a discord which are linked in the description thanks again for watching everybody and best of luck on your raids grind